modify the lung inflammatory consequences of these dust exposures. And then briefly at the end of the talk today, I'm also gonna share with you some results from um, another environmental exposure that we've recently become interested in and in the savannas as well, which is dust collected from um, areas surrounding the Salton Sea. And so I like to start off all of my talks with a reminder to myself as well as to everybody else in the audience that inflammation is a good thing. Um, inflammation is a normal endogenous process that um, our body utilizes to protect itself from pathogenic invasion, but then also to repair um, if a wound has occurred. And so if we were to get a cut in our skin, for example, there would be the tissue injury and release of local mediators that would lead to tissue swelling and um, cells coming out um, into the tissue to um, essentially take care of whatever uh, pathogen might be in that site as a result of that wound. Um, and then over time, you also get um, pathways turned on to um, repair that wound and start the, um, the process of getting back to what the tissue was like before the injury ever occurred. And with that in mind, the ultimate goal of inflammation is really resolution or return to tissue homeostasis. And so what do I mean by a return to tissue homeostasis? So there's several key factors that are involved in this process. Um, which would include the apoptosis or clearance of immune cells that came into that site. Down here is just a, a graphical representation um, of what an inflammatory process looks like that I briefly discussed with you a minute ago, which is the tissue swelling, neutrophil influx, but then um, something shifts and we start to um, turn on these repair pathways and ultimately um, recover from that injury. And so restitution or resolution also includes repair or regeneration of damaged tissues. And ultimately that tissue needs to be able to function again as it was before, before the injury. Okay. And so what happens when you do not get an effective resolution of inflammation? Well, there are a lot of different diseases that have an underlying or contributing component of a chronic inflammatory process that uh, mediates at least a portion of the disease and um, I'm a lung person, and so the lungs are the most important organ in the body. And so there, this is a list of some diseases that um, have you know, a contributing component um, of inflammation in their um, disease process. However, I recognize that not everybody is a lung person. And so it's important to keep in mind that I'm gonna be talking with you about the lung today, but Chronic inflammation is something that is going to be a factor in many different diseases um, as an underlying component. And so what is causing the, this, uh, these inflammatory diseases or chronic inflammation with a lack of resolution? So there are a variety of different things that are happening that are limiting the capacity of the effective resolution mechanisms to occur. Um, and some of them are listed here that would include you know, maybe genetic susceptibility um, or aging. Two um, factors that I'm gonna discuss with you today are diet or um, a specific component of the diet, which would be um, omega-3 fatty acid intake, as well as environmental exposures. And certainly today I'm gonna to be talking with you about agricultural exposures. So how exactly is diet involved in the inflammatory process? So polyunsaturated fatty acids are essential fatty acids. We need them, we must get them from our diet, um, and they're essential to many key biological processes. Um, what I'm gonna be focusing on today is their role in the regulation of the inflammatory process. And so some of what I'm gonna be saying is a bit of an overgeneralization, but in general, um, inflammation um, initiation um, is actually mediated in part by several lipid mediators that are derived from omega-6 fatty acids. And so if you um, are familiar with the terms prostaglandins, leukotrienes, thromboxanes, these are gonna be derived from omega-6 fatty acids and they're gonna be key in some of these initial steps, the initiation phase of the inflammatory process. Whereas the resolution phase of this process here um, are regulated by many mediators that derive from omega-3 fatty acids. 
And so these groups um, of lipid mediators include the resolvins, protectins, marisins. This isn't perfect. Um, there, for example, there is a group of pro-resolving lipid mediators, or SPM, as the, um, they're described, specialized pro-resolving mediators. There's a group of these mediators that, for example, comes from omega-6 fatty acids. But in general, this seems to be the, the basic equilibrium here. And so um, this is all fine and good, um, except when we consider the potential ramifications of the, the current diet of many individuals, for example, in the US. So the uh, ideal ratio of omega-3 to, or omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids is thought to be about one to one. It'd be nice if we could have approximately equivalent amounts of intake. Um, there have been um, benefits um, seen in certain clinical trials that have been associated with achieving a ratio of like four to one or five to one omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids. Um, <clears throat> in asthma, for example, just lungs. Um, but what we know is that um, based on population surveys, it looks like the US population is eating more like a 15 to one ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 populations. And then in certain other populations, that ratio may be even more severe. So for example, I have colleagues um, in Nebraska who um, did um, pre-frequency questionnaire surveys of individuals that have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and this was in an agricultural population. And they found that their ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids was over 50 to one. And so this is a real sort of disbalance in intake that um, could lead to a shift in substrate availability and usage when you're thinking about this initiation to resolution phase of um, inflammatory biology. So this is just a graph um, showing you the derivation of some of these products that I'll be talking with you about today. So I just wanted to show this to you to, um, to orient. So arachidonic acid and omega-6 fatty acids serves as a substrate to a lot of these pro-inflammatory mediators that you may be um, familiar with, the prostaglandins, leukotrienes, also that lipoxin group, which is a pro-resolving mediator. And then omega-3 fatty acids, including EPA and DHA, um, serve as a substrate for these pro-resolving lipid mediators, resolvins, uh, protectins, and reasons, which I'll spend some time talking with you about today specifically. There are also DPA-derived um, um, pro-resolving mediators as well, which we talked about earlier. So a bit of a background for a group that probably doesn't need it now. <laughs> um, suffice it to say, that uh, farms are really dusty. The current agricultural operations um, you know, generate a large amount of organic dust and aerosols that are potentially harmful to the individuals who are working in these environments. And these dusts are going to differ based on the industry. Um, so for example, um, crop farming dust exposures are going to lead to different um, disease risks than um, animal or like swine confinement facility dust, um, which is what I have primarily used in uh, my studies. It's also important to note that um, not only are the dust different um, and quite complex, but agricultural methods are also changing. And this is yielding um, new or you know, at least different um, health, or, uh, health or respiratory hazards to the individuals who are working in these areas. So for example, you know, uh, caged um, poultry farming practices um, actually um, seem to produce less dust than the cage-free facilities where the chickens are able to move around. So thinking about that within the concept of um, occupational health, it's something that we need to consider um, as we go forward with these different methods. And um, <clears throat> needless to say, agriculture workers experience quite a lot of chronic lung inflammation and they're at increased susceptibility to a variety of chronic lung diseases. Sorry, I keep forgetting I don't have it here. And so some common symptoms associated with the dust exposure. So if I were to walk into a swine confinement facility today and then come back out, I would have um, increased inflammatory cytokines in my, in my lungs that if you lavage my lungs, um, you know, put, uh, 
saline solution in my lungs and brought that back out and looked at what was there. There'd be increased pro-inflammatory cytokines. I might experience um, bronchoconstriction or chest tightness. And so these are all common symptoms that are experienced um, by individuals, um, certainly in, in a, an acute exposure, but then also in a chronic exposure um, as well. And um, in certain circumstances, um, individuals who are working in these environments and are chronically exposed, they have a sort of adaptate, um, adaptive effect where the, the symptoms and like cytokine levels, for example, overall are dampened compared to the acute exposure. But as I said, they're at increased risk for lung diseases and there are a lot of diseases specific to this population. Um, respirators um, are not consistently available or utilized and you can imagine it's very difficult work and the masks are often a hindrance to that work and there are a variety of other factors that affect this. Um, and so what we have done um, in Nebraska um, is work on developing several different models uh, preclinical models to study the inflammatory effects of these dust exposures and then to go on from that and understand uh, factors that might be impacting recovery from these dust exposures as well. And so I'll be sharing some of those with you today, which includes our mouse model of acute and repetitive dust exposures, as well as we um, utilize human lung tissue derived cells and the scaffolding of those cells to better understand wound repair processes. Um, using these models. Okay. So just to give you a brief background on our animal model of dust exposures. So the, um, we obtained dust that were collected from swine confinement facility um, in the um, Nebraska and Iowa regions. We have several um, facilities that we collected dust from. And we'll create an aqueous extract of that dust that is then sterile filtered through a 0.22 micron filter. And then for our animal model, we'll create a 12.5% solution of this dust extract and we'll um, instill it on, um, into the nose of the mice. They will breathe it in, they're under light um, exofluorine anesthesia, so they breathe it in. And what we see is that with an acute exposure, we see an increase in neutrophil influx into the lungs along with the um, typical or expected pro-inflammatory cytokine mediators in the lavage. So for example, after an acute exposure or a single exposure, we have increased TNF alpha levels, um, KC and MIT2, um, you might know these as CXCL1 and CXCL2, they're the IL-8 cognates um, and IL-6 levels. Over time, this response is uh, dampened. So there's this um, adaptive effect that we see. Um, and uh, what we know is that despite the levels of inflammatory cytokines going down, they're, um, they're always going to be significantly above what we see um, in the saline control mice. And importantly, even um, though the cytokine responsiveness goes down over time, we see the um, development of really dramatic lung pathology associated with repetitive dust exposure. And so this is just showing you control uh, mice with um, very nice um, or normal, we could say, lung path or um, lung <coughs> tissue. And then over um, a one to two week exposure, and we actually usually go out for three week exposure even, um, we see the development of really dramatic perivascular um, and peribronchial or inflammation, and the development of these lymphoid aggregates that are primarily T and B cells, just macrophages in these sites that we think could be um, perhaps like ectopic lymphoid structures develop in the lung. If we allow these mice to recover, from this exposure, within about a week, the, the perivascular and bronchiolar inflammation by and large goes away, but the lymphoid aggregates persist. We can even see um, evidence of them four weeks after we finish um, or allow the mice to recover from the dust exposure. So they're quite persistent. We also see changes to the bronchial epithelium of the lung, which uh, would be one of the first cells to really interact or experience the dust exposure or extract. And so, for example, they um, seem to be strong producers of pro-inflammatory cytokines that we see associated with this exposure here. And we also get the um, upregulation of, for example, ICAM-1. This is intracellular adhesion molecule 1. And this um, adhesion molecule um, facilitates interactions with neutrophils um, at this site to um, perhaps improve their function. And so, uh, the overarching question that I've been 
you know, asking um, throughout um, my training and research program development is whether or not omega-3 fatty acids could play a role in altering the lung response to these environmental agricultural exposures. And so we know that the pro-resolving lipid mediators, SPM here, play a role in regulating many of these processes that seem to be fairly chronic um, in these dust exposures, which includes the um, consistent upregulation of inflammatory cytokine production, neutrophil influx, and even the um, activation of the um, immune system or adaptive immune response that we see as well. And so um, I asked whether or not um, pro-resolving mediators could be used as a treatment or possibly um, omega-3 fatty acids could be used um, or supplementation with omega-3 fatty acids could be used as a way to mitigate some of the negative inflammatory consequences of these dust exposures, both acutely, but then also in a chronic repetitive setting. So um, I'm gonna be going through two primary aims with you today. Um, the first is uh, work that I did primarily as a postdoc, which was to look at the utilities of the pro-resolving mediator for reason one um, as a treatment to reduce this our agricultural dust-induced um, airway inflammation and promote repair, and then to also evaluate the utility of a high DHA diet, so DHA being the omega-3 fatty acid, um, and also reducing the negative consequences of these dust exposures. Okay, so just to begin with the results from that first aim, which was to use the Marisin treatment. Um, I wanna give you a little bit of a background on Marisin. So it is a pro-resolving lipid mediator that's derived from DHA. Um, I wanna to mention to you that it has a couple of isoforms that were originally identified. And so some of the studies that you'll see, um, some of the data that you'll see have both the 7S and the 7R isoform um, in the results. So I just wanted to point that out to you so that's what it, what it is. It's, uh, it's been found by uh, Kelly Surahan's group that the 7R isoform seems to be what is in, produced endogenously. Um, the uh, pro-resolving lipid mediators bind GPCRs, but Marisin's receptor has not been identified, so this is a specific um, G-protein coupled receptor. Um, Marisin's has not yet been identified. And uh, Marisin was, when it was originally identified, it was particularly of interest because it was found to be one of the pro-resolving mediators that had um, tissue regenerative capacities. And so this is data from the original model where they um, actually used a planarian model. They cut off the head of the worm and then they watch it regenerate over seven to 10 days. And what they found is that um, Marisin was able to enhance this regeneration. And so I was particularly interested in this because I was really interested in um, epithelial repair processes and um, how this could potentially work in the lung. So first we really wanted to know whether um, in our hands Marisin had similar um, repair capacities in bronchiopithelial cells as what was seen in this planarian model of wound repair. And so with this we actually used um, TGF-beta as a positive stimulus. TGF-beta basically will um, induce um, epithelial to mesenchymal transition which is necessary in these cells for wound repair to occur. And so what we saw is that in cells that were uh, wounded, for reason actually did about as well as TGF-beta at enhancing the repair process of bronchiopithelial cells when we actually wounded them. However, in the context of when we did not wound the bronchial epithelial cells, we found that Marisin actually inhibited some of the pathways associated with um, epithelial to mesenchymal transition. So in the context of a, um, an uninjured epithelium, we found that Marisin actually helped to maintain its epithelial polarization. Um, but in the context of an actual wound, it promoted repair. We also found that Marisin, sorry, I want to get out of the way the data. Um, we found that Marisin in the context of dust exposure significantly reduced the inflammatory cytokine um, release associated with that dust exposure in a dose dependent manner. I'm showing you IL-8 here, but we also looked at IL-6 and penis alpha as well and found that Marisin had this um, anti-inflammatory effect on 
So when we went into our acute model of dust exposure, um, what we found is that when we gave Marizin 1 as a pretreatment uh, to these mice prior to instilling the mice with the dust extract, we found that the 7S isoform of Marizin 1 um, significantly decreased the total cell influx into the lavage that we found in the lavage of the mice following this dust exposure. And this correlated with a significant decrease in the, that neutrophil influx. So Marizin did seem to be having um, an impact on the neutrophil response to the dust exposure in this acute model. And uh, likewise, the Marizin also had a significant effect on the inflammatory cytokines produced by um, in the lavage of these mice that were exposed to dust, um, including um, significant reductions in IL-6, TNF-alpha, and those IL-8 cognates, CXCL1 and CXCL2. We also found that Marizin also reduced the ICAM-1 expression that we knew um, was induced by dust exposure. Um, just this brown staining on the surface of these cells here was decreased with the Marizin treat in the Marizin treated group as well. So that was with our acute exposure. When we went on to the uh, repetitive exposure, these mice were treated with um, a single uh, dose of the dust extract each weekday for three weeks. And then um, in some of the mice, so in these recovery phase, they were allowed to recover from that three weeks of repetitive dust exposures for one week prior to um, the sacrifice. So it was either a five hour sacrifice or a seven day sacrifice after the dust exposures. And what we found is that once again, um, R here is standing for the isoform, so this is Marizin 7 R Marizin. Um, what we found is that the Marizin significantly decreased neutrophil um, influx in these mice, similarly to how it did in the acute phase. But it also seemed to, um, you know, in the recovery, sorry, in the recovery phase as well, it also seemed to have a significant reduction in neutrophils at that phase also. Um, we also saw that there were um, significant decrease in uh, some of the pro-inflammatory mediators that we see with this exposure. So once again, Marizin is decreasing the TNF-alpha production and uh, IL-8 cognate CXCL1 production, um, both immediately following the dust exposure and then also in recovery. Okay, similar to the acute phase or the acute exposure, we saw a significant reduction in ICAM-1 expression so uh, once again, Marizin seems to be having an impact on the bronchiepithelial cell um, response to the dust extract in the context of the repetitive dust exposure as well as the acute. Now that I've really set all of this up to make you think it was perfect, <laughs> I'm going to share with you the, the, the bad news, which is that the Marizin really did not have any significant impact on that lung pathology that I described to you earlier in the talk today. So the um, peribronchiolar, perivascular inflammation, as well as those mucoid aggregates were just as present in the Marizin treated groups as they were in the dust exposure. And this was for both the three week treatment as well as after one week of resolution. So this adaptive response does not seem to be um, resolved with the Marizin treatment as we, at least as we gave it. And so, to give you a summary of our findings associated with the Marizin treatment, so we found that in bronchiepithelial cells specifically, Marizin was able to reduce inflammatory cytokine production and ICAM-1 expression. It actually inhibits epithelial to mesenchymal transition and intact epithelium, and was able to enhance wound closure similar to a positive control in the injured um, epithelial monolayers. In our animal model, Marizin was able to reduce the dust um, induced acute and repetitive response, our airway response, if you will, to the, um, the dust exposure. So all of the um, lavage outcomes seem to be lower with Marizin treatment, lower neutrophil influx, lower inflammatory cytokines. However, we did not impact that lung pathology that's associated with the repetitive exposures. And so we really stepped back at that point and there are several factors that might be limiting the efficacy of the Marizin treatment. So certainly one is that these are mediators that are meant to be relatively short acting. They are um, inactivated quite readily. And so perhaps our treatment regimen or um, 
method was not sufficient to have an impact on this pathology. Um, we also know that by supplementing with Verizon, we're basically ignoring all of those other pro-resolving lipid mediators that are probably important to um, inflammation resolution as well. And so we wanted to step back and take um, a larger look at this and ask the question, instead of targeting a specific pro-resolving lipid mediator, what if we supplemented the mice with the substrate, so the omega-3 fatty acid itself, to see if we could enhance um, the resol pro-resolution effect of these mediators? So we did this um, using uh, DHA, so one omega-3 one omega fatty acid, um, and we um, used two different models. In our acute exposure model, we actually um, gave DHA by oral gavage for one week prior to the acute exposure. And then in our repetitive exposure model, we actually fed the mice a high DHA diet for four weeks prior to the initiation of the repetitive dust exposure. So they would have been on the diet for seven to eight weeks by the time the outcomes were assessed. And so DHA, much like the Marisen 1 results, does have a significant impact on bronchiepithelial cell responses to the agricultural dust exposures, um, including a reduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, release showing IL-8 here, but others were reduced as well. And then it also, significantly reduce the ICAM-1 expression on the cells where um, you can see here, this was done with flow cytometry this time, you can see that at baseline you have this level of ICAM-1 expression on the cells and um, our agricultural dust or hog dust extract, as the HD stands for, um, you know, significantly um, increases the expression of ICAM-1 while DHA pushes this back towards baseline. And so in our acute exposure model, once again, these mice were given an oral gavage for seven days of DHA. We saw um, quite dramatic, actually, reduction in inflammatory cytokine recruitment to the lungs following the acute exposure, which uh, correlated uh, with the reduced neutrophil influx into the lungs. And um, we often will look for uh, macrophage or leukocyte involvement, but this is really a neutrophil-dominated um, exposure setting, so we don't tend to see many changes in these other cell types. Um, in addition to the cell influx changes, we once again saw a significant reduction in the inflammatory cytokines associated with this um, exposure in mice that had the DHA treatment uh, or gavage, and so including all of our um, suspects that we talked about earlier, the IL-6, PNF-alpha, and then CXCL1 and CXCL2. Okay, and so this is going into the repetitive dust exposure model. So this is the model where these mice were actually placed on a high DHA diet for four weeks. Um, I didn't show the data today, but we did um, analysis to ensure that they were getting increased levels of DHA incorporated um, in the uh, red blood cells of the mice. And so we saw um, an increased DHA and corresponding decrease in the omega-6 fatty acid arachidonic acid with this diet. So we think the diet was successful in increasing the omega-3 fatty acid levels. And so uh, what we see on this diet is that the neutrophil levels are, uh, there's a trend toward a reduction. It's not nearly as dramatic as in the acute exposure model, but we see a trend towards a reduction of neutrophils in the lavage of these mice after repetitive exposure. And we see significant reductions in inflammatory cytokines, including TNF-alpha shown here. What we also see is that in the mice that are allowed to recover for one week following the cessation of the dust exposure, we see what we think may be um, the signs of an enhanced resolution phase um, in these mice. So lymphoid aggregates where that key outcome that I mentioned to you really persists in the lung for um, several weeks following the dust exposure. And what we see is that the lymphoid aggregates tend to be less um, in size, or sorry, um, fewer number and smaller in size in the uh, DHA model, so we think that they may be resolving more quickly um, in this model. And so what we also wanted to look at with the DHA model is whether or not we are impacting any of the repair mediators associated with this pathway or with um, the repair process in general. And so we, um, using an ELISA-based method, we looked for two of the uh, pro-resolving lipid mediators that are downstream of DHA or DHA metabolites. 
and found that they were um, quite consistently um, increased in the lavage of the mice on the high DHA diet uh, compared to mice that were fed the control or no DHA diet. And what we also saw that correlated with this is that there is a pro-repair mediator called amphiregulin. And amphiregulin, much like these uh, pro-resolving mediators, was significantly elevated in the um, mice that were fed the high DHA diet. And this was consistent at both the five-hour sac after repetitive exposure as well as the one-week um, recovery period. They were consistently elevated. Okay, so just a little bit more background about amphiregulin. So amphiregulin is a pro-repair mediator. It's a pro-epithelial repair mediator. In particular, um, it binds to um, EGFR, or epidermal growth factor receptor, but it can act on other cell types. Um, besides epithelial surfaces. And um, what we have previously found is that bronchial epithelial cells um, exposed to dust will release amphiregulin um, quite robustly in response to this. And so we were interested in how DHA might be regulating um, the amphiregulin production in our model. And so to look at repair more directly, um, we decided to move to a model of repair that is based on um, decellularized human lung scaffolding. And so basically what we do is we'll take human cadaver's lung tissue and we will inflate it with a series of detergents. And what this does is completely decellularizes the lung tissue. So there's no more cells. It's only the extracellular matrix um, in, the, in the lung lobe now. And then we will cut slices of this lung scaffolding and seed it, seed those scaffolding slices and look at the ability of the epithelial cells to grow on the scaffold as a model of repair. And so what you're seeing here in A is just the completely denuded um, decellularized scaffold. And then um, as we see the cells, watching them grow along the scaffold from three to 12 days here. Um, and so what we do at the end is determine um, the number of cells that have grown on the scaffold. And what we know is that using this model, when we treat with our dust extract in the presence of this um, recolonization process, the dust extract significantly um, impedes the, the attachment or growth of the cells on the scaffold. So that's the black line growing here as compared to the open asterisk, which would just be the control cells that did not have any dust extract. And so um, we next tested the impact of amphiregulin on this process. So what you're seeing here now is just the, the number of cells growing on the scaffold and control. Um, <clears throat> the dust extract significantly reduces this, as I showed you before. Amphiregulin alone significantly enhances the repair process. This is expected because it's a pro-repair mediator, so this is good. Um, and then it actually um, rescues the dust-induced colonization deficit um, here, so it gets it back up to um, at least control levels and perhaps a bit better even. And so if we uh, treat with an amphiregulin neutralizing antibody, um, we actually you know, significantly impact the ability of these cells to grow on the scaffold and um, the, the um, positive effect amphiregulin is having on the scaffolds is eliminated. And so we became really interested in this DHA amphiregulin um, process in part because DHA seems to mediate amphiregulin production in a very interesting manner where if we give DHA as a pretreatment, so one hour before we um, give the dust exposure, we see that the, the DHA actually leads to a reduction in amphiregulin production by these cells should be noted that the DHA also reduces inflammatory cytokine production as well. So this is correlative with those numbers. Um, however, if we give DHA as a post-treatment to the dust exposure, so we give it one hour after the cells being exposed to the dust, we see a significant enhancement in amphiregulin production. So we think that DHA is impacting the repair process once again in the setting of injury. And so, um, indeed, if we give DHA 
to these cells growing on the scaffold, they actually are able to colonize the scaffolds better than the control cells. And here, once again, is the dust-induced deficit in colonization of the scaffolds, and we see that DHA is able to um, rescue this dust-induced deficit. And interestingly, if we use that um, amphiregulin blocking antibody, we completely eliminate the positive effects of DHA. So we think that um, DHA is working at least in part through this amphiregulin pathway to mediate some of the positive effects it has on repair in this, these epithelial cells. To give you a summary of the DHA study findings, so in bronchi epithelial cells, we found that it reduces inflammatory cytokine production and ICAM-1 um, induction caused by the dust exposure. It also enhances amphiregulin exposure in the context of a dust um, induced inflammatory cytokine response and sees enhanced wound healing capacity um, mediated through amphiregulin. In our model of acute and repetitive dust exposures in mice, we found that DHA seems to reduce neutrophil influx certainly at the acute, um, in the acute setting and also reduces inflammatory cytokine release in the airways and it seems to be doing this by increasing pro-repair or improving repair mechanisms by increasing these pro-repair mediators. And um, we are still looking at additional outcomes to understand how it might be impacting that lung inflammatory pathology, but the data do suggest that it might be speeding that resolution. And so we have several ongoing studies um, associated with this work. Certainly we're interested in um, looking in further detail how these pro-resolving lipid mediators and omega-3 fatty acids are actually impacting this lung inflammatory response. I come to this um, with the mindset of sort of a, an epithelial um, biologist. I'm very interested in the actions of these on epithelial and mesenchymal stem cell populations as opposed to just the immune cell within, um, within these models. And um, we're also really interested in looking at other exposure models. So we've been branching out and looking at how different dust exposure models also impact the lung inflammatory response. And so I wanna just take a little bit more time today to talk with you about some of the work that we've been doing with samples from, um, taken from areas surrounding the Salton Sea. Okay, so just a little bit of background on the Salton Sea. Um, these images here are um, actually images of the Salton Sea that were taken by NASA in um, 1984 and 2015, sort of showing the, the water regression line on the Salton Sea shore. So the Salton Sea uh, is a lake that was created by accident. Um, in 1905, there's a breach in the irrigation canal from the Colorado River, and so by the time everything was fixed, there was this lake. And um, it's um, primarily fed by agricultural runoff, and has been um, basically evaporating um, and concentrating um, any and all the contaminants associated with that runoff into the water over time. And so um, the region surrounding the Salton Sea um, has um, high incidences of asthma. Um, we have focused in our group on areas uh, to the north of the Salton Sea, although I know that um, groups here have been looking on the south side of the Salton Sea, but um, what we can say is that surrounding the Salton Sea, there is a much higher incidence of asthma, both childhood and adult asthma, um, as compared to the rest of California. And there's a variety of different factors that are likely contributing to this. Um, one of them um, potentially being these dust exposures that they're exposed to, as well as other um, socioeconomic factors, for example. Um, I just want to show you this, this graph that we have where um, this is incidence of adult asthma in the Salton Sea here. And the, um, the very high blue level is very high incidence. And this little light blue level is Palm Desert. So um, certainly the dust exposure itself is not the only factor that's at play here. Um, so I've been collaborating with several faculty at UC Riverside to um, look at the impact of these dust exposures on lung health outcomes. And so I came into the group with um, several investigators having already uh, developed a small animal chamber exposure model to use for these studies. 
And so this is just a, a sort of a diagram of this chamber um, here where the mice are able to sit in and basically breathe in nebulized extract solutions that we prepare for them um, in a continuous manner. Um, and this graph is basically showing you where these dust have been collected by um, Emma Aronson, who's another um, colleague of mine who has done all of the dust collections. This, uh, the salt and sea dust, as we describe it, was uh, collected at the Dos Palmas Reserve. And the, we um, also have a little bit of data that was collected at a distant site, sort of as um, a comparison for whether the responses that we were seeing are general or specific, perhaps, um, to the salt and sea region. So to begin, we did a little bit of toxicological studies to look at the um, inflammatory consequences of the salt and sea dust exposures on bronchiopithelial cells. So similar to what I showed you with the soil confinement facility dust, the salt and sea dust um, treatment um, elicits a potent inflammatory response in bronchiopithelial cells, it's showing IL-6 release, for example, um, at five in the 24 hour. And we also, oh, I meant to mention, this is the echo collection method. So this is a, um, cake pan um, that um, Emma Aronson will, she puts marble beads in this and um, it has some uh, deterrence for birds to, has like tangle foot and such to deter any bird roosting. And she uh, puts this on a, I believe a, an eight or nine foot pole and it just ambiently collects the dust or um, passively, I guess, passively collects the dust over time. Um, she'll then elute the uh, dust sample um, through, the, through the mesh and collect the sample, um, elutes it with a liter of water to just wash all the dust off the marble. That's the method. Um, and so we used the extracts collected from this method and in the, that chamber that I showed you on the previous slide, we um, had mice in that chamber continuously exposed to the, um, the extract for seven days. And what we saw is that um, in general, there was a strong neutrophil response to the salt and sea dust extract in this model. So what these um, are showing here are actually just two different strains of mice showing a somewhat similar response. So these are um, black six mice. This is what I used for all the previous studies. You see a strong neutrophil response and um, the other strain of mice had a similar but um, dampened response compared to the black six mice. And this is also showing um, an inflammatory cytokine that's really associated with neutrophil levels, so um, myeloperoxidase levels were high in the black six mice as well. Okay, um, and so we also wanted to do this in comparison with that dust extract, or the dust that was taken from that site that was distant from the salt and sea. And so what you're seeing here, um, the gold bars are the salt and sea dust extract, basically the data I just showed you um, in a different form, where you're getting the recruitment of neutrophils into the lungs. Um, however, here, what you're seeing <laughs> is that um, the Oasis um, de los Ojos uh, dust um, basically does not induce any kind of neutrophilic response that we could see um, at um, uh, concentrations that were kept equal within the chamber um, exposure model. So we do think that the salt and sea dust in particular has this inflammatory um, impact on the, on the lung and so studies are ongoing to both increase the amount of dust that we have to work with, <laughs> but then to better understand the nuances of the salt and sea dust exposure. Okay. So just some final thoughts that I wanna leave you with today. Um, agricultural and other environmental dust exposures certainly do elicit potent lung inflammatory responses. And omega-3 fatty acids and their derivatives, the SPM, um, really play um, important roles in actively resolving inflammation. Um, it wasn't too long ago that it was thought that um, inflammation was all about the initiation phase and then as those mediators sort of went away, things just resolved. Um, but now it's really recognized that that's not the case and that there are active programs required to turn off the inflammatory process and promote repair and recovery. And so Marisen and DHA do show promise in minimizing some of the air inflammatory consequences of these dust exposures and um, in promoting repair pathways within bronchiopithelial cells. And so um, our goal um, in the coming years is to better understand uh, whether or not and how omega-3 fatty acids have 
information could um, prove to or improve the long inflammatory consequences of repetitive dust exposures and um, its potential as a viable um, therapeutic intervention. With that, um, I'd like to take a moment to thank everybody that was really involved in this work. I have a, a really great lab that um, has been instrumental in much of this work um, at UCR. My postdoctoral mentor is at Romberger, and our tires, who's a technician in our group, and all of the great collaborators who really helped make this happen. Um, and with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. to California, you have to shift your thinking from soybeans and pigs or hogs to the, the things we grow in California. And, and California agricultural dust exposures have been collected and well characterized. They're basically inorganic silicates is dominant and, um, and you know, it's somewhat different from salt and sea. And I guess my question is, do you have plans to look at those dusts in the models? Because that's what the majority of California farm workers are exposed to. Um, and you know, a lot of that work was you know, in vivo and in vitro studies done at Davis, in fact. Uh, yes, um, so the short answer is yes. Um, as I'm um, moving into this new region, um, I'm branching out to understand these specific um, concerns for this region. Um, the farming is quite different. Um, and we have, for example, a poultry experiment station that on the UCR campus that I'm collecting samples for. Um, the salt and sea dust at, um, effects. Um, I've also been contacted by collaborators that are interested in, um, for example, um, aerosolized exposures from the wildfires and such. So I'm interested in moving to exposure models that are more reflective of this environment, certainly. And um, I welcome any opportunity to get a foot in the door for doing some of those collections and such. So um, if you have any advice and pitches to that, I, I'll be here. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. I'm just curious as an overall picture, how does uh, ag dust pollution relate to like urban pollution? Is it um, worse, better, just different disease manifestations? Or I'm just trying to get a sense of where this fits into like a urban pollution. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, they are different. So there have been some studies. Um, so for example, I think with the agricultural exposures, for example, early childhood um, exposures to um, farms, um, growing up on farms, um, is protective against many allergies or allergic diseases, whereas you don't have that same protective effect living in a very urban, um, polluted environment. You actually have sort of the opposite. So um, the, the mechanisms uh, I don't think are quite as clear. There's also this um, concept that perhaps um, there might be a protective effect against lung cancer in um, individuals working in high endotoxin levels, particularly um, cotton industry, swine consignment facilities, and other areas with high um, LPS or endotoxin burden. Um, it's called the endotoxin hypothesis. And whereas um, chronic exposure to particulate matter, such as um, in an urban environment, may increase risk 
And you know, a lot of these come from epidemiological studies and there just haven't been very good, there hasn't been much follow-up as far as understanding the mechanisms, or at least the follow-up has been quite inconclusive as to why. Um, so I think that there's a lot of work to be done to consider the, you know, these different exposures and the combined exposures as well. So, because especially now, um, you know, there are many regions that are gonna have both. I've seen some papers by the Dolly and Cern group that they do uh, statins together with some of the SPMs and then mm. they get increased effect of this withholding effect. So they try to give statins to the mice no. at the same time to do the do the DHA, for instance, to see if you can get an increased production of the statins. I haven't maybe done a bigger it. effect. Yeah, I, I I think I remember the papers that you're mentioning, but no, I haven't done anything like that as of yet. I think that um, thinking in terms of you know combined ther therapy approaches is a great idea. Yeah. Sorry, did you uh, reduce your uh, AK2 content when you increased the DHA content in your first one? Yeah. So we. Um, so. The arachidonic acid levels were significantly reduced. Um, in, in the we, diet? Or I'm sorry? In the diet or in the blood? In the blood. Okay. Um, reduced when we were on the diet for four weeks. Which you, you um, would expect. Mm -hmm. but, it, but, but as far as what they were eating, it, was it equivalent calories for what they were? Yes. Yeah. And did you? In your controls, replace those calories with 18.2, 18.1, or 18.0? Can you remind me what the common names are for the? Uh, linolate, ferrate, oleate. Yeah, so we used a, a high oleic 